Okay, so uh, you know, I'll start out saying you know, thank you for the introduction, and uh, Gene and I are very pleased to be up here. We've been working on this business guide now for about the last year, uh, and you know, we had a lot of help from across the organization. We just were facilitators in collecting and gathering the data to create what we believe is a pretty good document for uh, the scope and direction of the group. So, and that's the reason that this uh, particular um, <clears throat> document was created was so that one, the people that aren't necessarily in the group today can, can read about what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about a couple of things, including why we're here, why the forum was created, some of the use cases that were created, the ecosystem around that, um, some of the quality attributes and sort of um, you know, the call to action that kind of happens with that. So we'll go ahead and get started with um, you know, what happens in, what's the vision of this group, right? It's the creation of an open standard for uh, process automation architecture, right? There are a couple key ideas that were uh, important to make sure that we're included as we move forward in this space. So easily integrates best in class components through interoperability. So one of the, the reasons that it was started in this space was want to have a, a way to accelerate innovation. The belief is that by allowing interoperability in your control system, you can have uh, other people uh, than your currently suppliers participate uh, as well. And so that system integration can happen for best in class solutions in a lot of different spaces in your factory. Adaptive and intrinsically secure. Um, adaptive in the fact that it needs to be able to both incorporate existing technology and older technologies as well, which goes to the intrinsically secure piece uh, to it. Like we, a lot of the machines that will probably be connected in the whole Internet of Things world, uh, as you start looking at this, will have uh, data flows that have never been connected to anything before. And so there is obviously some concern in that space around as you do that, how do you make sure that that data feed is secure and it's not hackable. Obviously, if someone was able to get into the control system of your factory, there could be some concerns in that space. So we want to make sure that security is built into the system from the ground up as opposed to applied uh, later over the top. Uh, module integrations of certified components. So one of the things that uh, we're working on next after the business guide now is complete is uh, conformance. So how do you certify that these components are going to work in this interoperable system so that any fit for purpose uh, products that are sent in this space, the end user or the buyer uh, can be confident that that's going to work in as it is intended. Uh, promotes innovation and value creation. So the idea, like we said earlier, was with that interoperability, we believe it creates an opportunity for further innovation. And with that, we believe there's value creation that can happen. You know, what we've said is we're, we're looking at this both from a technical and a business perspective so that there's opportunities for end users, suppliers, systems integrators to all find new ground and fertile ground for um, opportunity. And then finally, development of portable applications. So, you find something that works in uh, one factory, you want to be able to move it to another that maybe doesn't necessarily even have the same type of system. The idea is sort of like you can move your applications from one location to another, like happens in sort of the IT world today. So this group was started by a couple of key uh, founders, if you will, back in November of 2000. And 16 uh, in a very hot and cramped conference room in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> um, and we've grown quite quickly, uh, 115 as of the middle of January. I've heard that the business guide has actually been generating some interest, so we may be a little above that now, so hopefully that uh, continues. You can see that there's a lot of major corporations participating in this. Uh, I know my company is very interested as we look for, you know, how does general purpose compute play into the space. So um, what's the mission of the group? So when you look at the standard, uh, you know, it really becomes how do we publish a standard that is a realistic open architecture uh, so that everybody can participate, the suppliers, the integrators, the end users. You know, some of the things that we've talked about is the standard should be around some of the interfaces and how uh, so that anybody can connect, if you will. 
So the intent is to utilize existing and emerging standards wherever possible. The group's intention is to, if, if at all possible, not create new standards. We'd like to create a standard of standards, if you will. Um, but wherever there isn't one, obviously, we'll have to maybe take that on. So, and as I said earlier, we're, we're addressing both the technical and business aspects within the framework so that um, recognizing that if, if it doesn't make a lot of business sense, uh, it's not going to move forward very easily. So uh, a little bit about the organization of the forum. So uh, probably the key thing here to look at is the bottom row. So if we start on the, the lower left, if you will, the business working group, this is where Gene and I have led the subcommittee for the business guide. Um, we're trying to address the ecosystem of players in the space to be able to make sure that um, it makes business sense to move forward. And we are, you know, Gene will talk a little bit about, I think one of the key slides you'll see today is how we envision the ecosystem playing out in the future and, and where that space comes in and how we've thought through that. Uh, on the far right is the technical working group. So these uh, folks are working on what should that technical standard be? How do we actually create that? And what do we need to understand uh, as the system is created to be able to, to pull in the right standards? And then the two middle groups here, one being the enterprise architecture working group is how we sort of pull the business and the technical leads together to make sure whether we understand kind of how they fit and how they interoperate. Uh, and then the standards body interface working group is you know, helping us to go find those standards uh, you know, that exist so that we're not creating something new uh, that is already in the world today uh, unnecessarily. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Gene. Um, just so you know, Gene just told me before we started here that it, this was his dream to present to a forum of uh, a technical audience. So let's give him a round of applause as we fulfill his dream. <laughs> it's nice to be able to check off those uh, <laughs> bucket list items. And so now talking in front of computer architects is off the list. So um, I'll, I'll pick up now where my colleague left off in terms of looking at the various groups and how they work together. Um, because it's important to understand how we're going to develop these standards. It starts with business use cases written by end users um, and manufacturers and um, documenting use cases and things they'd like to see out of the future state system. Um, in addition, um, the, one of the founding people and drivers of the Open Process Automation Forum, Don Bartusiak, uh, during that November hot crowded room, he asked uh, uh, the member companies who are the founding members to contribute statements, founder statements, why they're joining the forum. And so between the business use cases and the founder statements, we started drawing out common themes that would form the basis of requirements. Those requirements were then turned over to our enterprise architecture working group for compilation, uh, prioritization, um, getting further into uh, the meaning of those requirements. In turn, those requirements will then drive the technical standard produced by the technical working group. So drawing back from the beginning, it starts with business use cases, which we've documented extensively in the business guide. And I want to thank, there's some authors of portions of those business guides in the audience. Thank you for your contribution. We use those business use cases plus the founder statements and then from then teased out the requirements that the enterprise architects analyzed and are pat then translate over to technical uh, requirements as executed by the technical working group. And in that fashion, we have this flow through, flow back to ensure uh, that we have the requirements um, as documented by the enterprise architecture group, satisfying the business use cases, the founder statements via the technical standard. And uh, what we found through the business use cases, the request out to the companies, we drew from all across the process industries. So there's oil and gas. We had submittals from mining and metals, pulp and paper, bulk chem, fine chemicals, biopharmaceutical, exploration and production, common themes across the industry. Um, and those were distilled into the requirements driven, again, by business use cases and founder statements. So among those themes, we categorize them into technical themes and uh, business outcomes. 
Um, and Darren covered some of these already. He talked about interoperability, uh, what we saw from most end users and manufacturers, disparate control systems within a factory or a plant, not talking to each other. And we really, uh, as, as an end user myself, uh, really want these systems to integrate seamlessly. Reusable configuration, a lot of um, energy, um, and we've put into the code that runs our factories, that represents IP from our company, and we'd like to make it portable across platforms. So reusable configurations was another theme that came out in the business use cases. Um, this one means a lot to me personally, standard interfaces. I spent a lot of time doing custom APIs and custom drivers, and um, it took a lot of time. It was hard to maintain. So the need for standard in interfaces was, uh, again, a strong driver for putting this uh, forum together. Integrating best-in-class technology is something Darren's already talked about. Um, I'd like to elaborate a little further on something also Darren talked about, industrial internet of things. Um, there is a large number, with, with the advent of cheap processors and inexpensive sensors, we see an explosion of data from the field, typically not connected to a control system. So it's I.O. in the field, not part of an existing control system. Um, this um, data from the field uh, is there, there's tremendous potential in driving, uh, using analytics to drive further productivity insights, gain efficiencies in production. Um, and so bring that into a big data lake or a big data platform and doing analytics is something uh, a lot of the end users uh, uh, would like to achieve. Um, on the analytics piece, my company, and I think I speak for a lot of other manufacturers, we were setting up data science teams and uh, to, once we ingest this large body of data that's out in the field, you, uh, bringing our scientists into um, the analysis, and again, to drive productivity benefits and uh, improve yields, um, that, that's going to be enabled by the Open Process Automation Forum. Uh, Darren's talked about the cybersecurity piece. I'll delve into predictive maintenance. So another new area tied into industrial Internet of Things is um, the processors in the field and the ability to um, diagnose equipment, model the equipment um, in, in a, for our company in particular, um, big fans, pumps, motors, compressors that uh, drive big equipment. Um, we want it to run as long as possible. We're trying to avoid some kind of premature failure or catastrophic failure that uh, brings about downtime in the manufacturing floor. So predictive maintenance is um, uh, a piece that a lot of end users would like to continue to drive to, and again, driven by proliferation of inexpensive sensors and uh, cheap computing power. Um, advanced control and modeling. So have, uh, this per in particular comes from the oil and gas industry. In, in operating big refineries, there's opportunities to layer on applications on top of the control platform, um, and it's not easily done in t in, with legacy systems that tend to have and require um, custom interfaces. So part of Open Process Automation Forum and the standard interfaces is to have that seamless integration of layered applications on top of control systems. So uh, the seamless integration is, is something that a lot of people have been asking for as part of technical themes. And then robotics, yet another control system for robots integrated on the plant form needing to talk to the other systems in, a, in, in the manufacturing space. So the business themes, and I've kind of touched upon that uh, through the technical <coughs> themes, but the business outcomes that we seek to deliver um, include zero minimal downtime, schedule flexibility. One, one use case in particular, I believe it comes from um, refining and chemicals, is the idea that rather than taking down the whole system and losing uh, revenue during that time, is the ability to gain schedule, schedule flexibility, take down parts of the system or one loop at a time, one part of the plant at a time, and be able to continue to run and so do upgrades in a way that achieves this zero or minimal downtime, um, as well as uh, uh, per, uh, operating in a safe manner through this cutover migration. Um, the, the standard interface piece really drives the next bullet, reduced engineering hours. So we're getting away from custom interfaces. Um, with standard open interfaces, we'll be able to layer on applications and um, with the certified products that are part of the open process automation suite, uh, we should be able to take out the hours of maintenance and development of these um, uh, custom interfaces. 
speed to market and um, product quality and re deferred reduced capital spending, I'll draw from my own in industry in pharmaceuticals. Um, <clears throat> often um, we're in competition with other companies, similar products arriving on the market at the same time, so there's a big advantage for those who are first to market. And um, in, in most of the plant and facility startups I've been associated in the farm industry, uh, the qualification of the process control system has been the rate limiting step. That is the last step that, uh, in bringing the factory up. So by reducing custom interfaces, we can compress the amount of time it takes to qualify the facility and bring it up and reduce uh, the time to market. Um, in addition, um, in the farm industry, we conduct clinical trials on people before we're allowed to release product to, to patients. And, um, and in doing these um, risky clinical trials, sometimes you can fail at phase two or phase three. So we've seen the problem in my industry where um, we've started a capital project, uh, a long timeline product, um, and only at the, at the very end of the clinical trials realize, hey, this is not as effective or safe as we thought it was. And then so you have all this wasted effort in deployment. If we can compress timelines in, in getting the facility, we can delay the deployment of the capital and make a decision at the last possible moment before spending all that capital. And so uh, product traceability um, is enabled when all your systems in a factory talk to each other. You can identify when in certain stages of the uh, manufacture of the product there was a problem. Um, and I talked about reduced qualification costs as well. So. Um, common themes that came out of business use cases and founder statements, which then are compiled into requirements. Requirements then drive the open process automation standard. Okay. So um, another chapter, I'm switching gears here, away from business use cases, but to the ecosystem that Darren referred to. We did, as part of the business working group, a very comprehensive analysis of the process control industry and the roles that are needed to develop, design, and deploy a process control system. And it's important to note that um, we need to think of these as roles in the ecosystem and not necessarily companies. Companies can play a single role in the ecosystem, but uh, more often than not, they can encompass multiple roles. But we needed to do this breakdown of the ecosystem in to roles for two reasons. For one, this is a business guide and we're trying to um, speed up adoption and speed up understanding of what the form is trying to achieve. And so we did this ecosystem analysis and laid it out in the business guide so existing players in the ecosystems can read the guide and see themselves in the ecosystem. Okay, yeah, this is where I am currently. And then we did a mapping into the future state using um, a business model canvas analysis. And this was to help those current players in the ecosystem see where they are today and where potentially they could go in the future. Um, the second important reason to do the ecosystem was around understanding where we wanted to set up the open and published um, interfaces. And so in between roles, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through the roles now. There's an end user role, a system integrator role, a subsystem integrator role, um, hardware supplier role, software supplier role, and a service supplier role. So those were the identified roles within the ecosystem. And again, don't think of it in terms of companies, although companies can comprise a single role, more likely companies can do various roles across the ecosystem. But the role analysis is important because we wanted to establish where handoffs took place and where we have handoffs, that's where we'll put in those open and published standards. Um, an example to help people understand the, the, the roles in the process control, process automation space. If you think of um, a plant, like common plant, like um, a, bo um, a power plant, you'll have um, an automation contractor for typically for the whole um, power plant, and that would typically be a system integrator role. The end user would be the power company. It could be, it could be an oil company. Whoever's running the the, uh, the power plant. So the power plant is typically com consists of a turbine. Um, you'll have the balance of plant. You'll have a boiler. Those are all subsystems within your power plant. And typically, a sus subsystem integrator would be in charge of each component of that power plant. 
And then the subsystem, the turbine provider, for example, would contract out a hardware control system and then layer on software, maybe do it all in-house, maybe apportion it to someone else. But the key, the key point is there is a trade-off. There is an exchange of, um, of, of requirements from one role to another, usually accompanied by money. And, and the deliverable from the supplier in that, playing that, uh, the role of the supplier in that role will be a design, maybe it's software, documentation, and the like. So it's in between roles where we see exchanges. Again, from one party, typically a set of requirements and probably some money, and then in return they get code and they get uh, design deliverables and heck of a lot of documentation. <laughs> so in, in those spaces is where we want to establish the um, the open standards, and by identifying them earlier, we'll be better positioned for success in getting this work as, uh, as a business ecosystem. Okay. So to do this analysis, we got together as a business working group and went through this um, uh, business process called the Osterwalder Business Model Canvas. Um, and what, what the business model canvas analysis does is you look at companies playing certain roles. You look at who their customers are, what their revenue streams are, um, what their costs are, uh, what training do their people need to, to be able to execute in, as part of the ecosystem. And um, to get the best possible analysis, we brought together um, people from across uh, the industry to do the analysis and provide feedback to, to each other. And out of this uh, three-day workshop, we developed the current state and a projected future state. Um, and with that future state included what the value proposition of each role is in the future state, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats in the future state. So going back to the original premise of why we did this workshop, why we had to do the analysis for the ecosystem, it was twofold. One, to get existing players in the ecosystem to read the business guide, see the role they currently play, and then read through the analysis that this team did to see and project in the future what opportunities do we have in the future in this ecosystem. And so um, you can read in great detail all we said about what the future state looks like in the business guide, but to give you a teaser, here's some of the themes that we, we, we saw. Um, a, more flex a more flexible execution model once the open process automation standards are in place. We see more players being able to take on more roles within the ecosystem because of the pub uh, published open standards. And lower barriers to entry and increased innovation. Um, and as part of um, the original goal of doing the forum, the best in class solutions, that also came out as a theme that in multiple parts of the, of the OPA ecosystem, um, best in class solutions would be able to be integrated more seamlessly. Um, importantly, there are also emerging business models and opportunities. So just because you have a current state with current revenue streams for role players in the ecosystem, um, doesn't mean that those things are static. When you introduce the open standards, new revenue streams, new business models will emerge. And what we also uh, conjectured was that first movers in the space, so if you follow the developments of the open process automation and you understand where things are today and where things may be in the future, being a first mover in the space will give you uh, a better chance of increasing revenue and taking advantage of the new emerging business models. We also saw reduced customization, uh, the ability to port software, software and configurations, leverage across platforms. Um, faster adoption of new technologies was also um, part of the hypothesis of the future state. And finally, conformance and certification being key to making it all work. So with that, I'll say a few words about conformance. Um, conformance, and I borrowed these slides, thank you, Louise, uh, uh, from a gentleman in the audience. And, uh, and it was helpful to um, include this information both in the business guide and as well to talk through this in, in, in this plenary session. Conformance is key to the success. It's understood as 100% adherence to the technical standard. And it's not enough for a company just to self-declare, oh, we adhere to the OPAF standard. 
The conformance has to come from a verification authority, and that verification authority will be uh, stood up as part of the development of the Open Process Automation Forum. And uh, the conformance has legal standing. And uh, that, that's also important in ensuring um, the sanctity of the standard. Conformance is applicable to a product uh, offering from um, a supplier following the Open Process Automation Standard. It's not the whole system itself. But if the system, <coughs> as in its entirety, is comprised of OPAF uh, compliant components, you have high assurance for the ultimately the end user that um, all the components will work in a, in a seamless and tight fashion. Um, and the conformance does not apply to the performance of the overall system, just to uh, adherence to the open process automation standard. And there will also be, as, um, as we develop out the conformance committee, a, uh, a way to register conformant uh, products and to advertise and market them as um, adherence, adherent to the OPAF standard. Okay. Um, I'll say a few words as well about certification. Certification is primarily um, for buyers to be confident that what they're getting is a product that adheres to the open process automation standard and is going to be, uh, uh, be able to allow the end user to integrate products uh, without a lot of retesting and documentation. We're also trying to create preference for these conformant products. So in the marketplace, you have non-conformant products and you have conformant. And um, by creating um, a market for OPAF products and the certification of these products, uh, to try to drive preference to those products that conform to the standard. Um, OPAF is looking to, to also establish a timely and affordable process that reduces redundant testing and integration costs. We talked about how that is a primary driver uh, for doing the forum. We want to protect the integrity of the technical standard. And uh, finally, Darren and I, and we've got a new colleague joining us, Julie Smith, um, we're going to take a crack at writing a contract guide. So following the business guide will be a contract guide. Um, and it'll include generic language for both suppliers and end users on how to transact an OPAF conformant product um, with uh, generic language and guidelines to get people started. Okay. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Darren. He'll talk yeah. to us about quality attributes. So yeah, um, when we were looking at the uh, how we approach this problem, one of the things that we looked at was we brought the technical and the business leaders together into a, 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 another workshop where we said, well, we need to understand um, collectively what the quality attributes of the system need to entail. Uh, we started off by saying, you know, there are a few key ones that are so inherent, that they're almost above and beyond kind of that attribute. So we'll talk about, those were safety, resilience, and maintainability. So without those, um, the system wasn't even viable to begin with. And then what we did was we looked at, we had, a, I don't know the exact number, uh, at least 25 plus different attributes that we had kind of brainstormed ahead of that workshop. And the goal was to look at those, understand what each of those meant. Um, and there's uh, an explanation in the guide as well on each of these that you see here as the top 10 on what those mean. Uh, and we collectively determined how, you know, followed a process to determine what's the priority of them. And I think we'll just talk through maybe the first uh, five here as important. So interoperability, I think you've heard that theme uh, from myself as well as Gene a couple of times. Uh, you know, I think that's probably uh, obvious why that one came out on top. Modularity, so how do we uh, be able to incorporate different portions of the system that can be deployed in various ways uh, that interoperate a standard conformance, which Gene, you know, did a, uh, you know, went and did a little farther investigation on here and talked to you about. Want to make sure that um, anything that's sort of gets the OPAF stamp of approval, if you will, uh, is going to be able to to interface with the other components. Uh, scalability. So how do you, uh, how does this work? From I've got a small uh, instantiation where I only need maybe you know, 12 to 50 IO or something that's based to a, a full on, you know, large factory of some sort that might have, you know, hundreds of thousands of inputs uh, as well. So we need to be able to scale from small to, to large. 
And then securability. Obviously, this one is um, the talk um, um, a lot in the space where uh, we need this to really happen in, in a secure way um, because it is so important. You know, I think we've we've talked about a lot of different um, breaches over the past uh, several years that have uh, become very public, and you know, trying to understand kind of what that means. The other, you know, five here, um, you know, also very important, but. Really, the top five is what we call the, the highest of the high. Um, and then, you know, we try to incorporate anything else that we can. So we think some of the, probably the next five here are going to be um, some of the, you know, the, the first five are probably uh, minimum requirements. The next five almost is where, you know, some of the value can be created, in, in my opinion, right? Reliability, affordability, portability, availability, those kind of things. Um, are available to be able to create value around for end users and for the suppliers in the space. Um, so, you know, one of the questions that um, we thought we would address in this presentation, I don't, I don't, I don't think we have addressed it, particularly in the business guide other than mention it is, so why do we believe that we can be successful in this space? Uh, we're trying to utilize learnings from previous transformations, and the two that have been called out uh, in the past that we've had discussions upon um, our first are telecommunications to a software defined network. So if you go back uh, several years and you look at AT&T and China Mobile, uh, their networks were breaking, if you will. Um, they weren't scalable. It was very proprietary hardware in the space and software uh, and very expensive. So with the advent of, of smartphones that you all probably carry around in your pocket, uh, the explosion of data over those networks uh, was becoming unbearable. The network providers couldn't keep up. Uh, that sort of drove this transformation. And so being able to move to sort of an, an open type of system uh, for networking, so all of your uh, cell phones now run on a, a more open network as uh, around the world. You know, like I said, the two big companies and users that drove that were AT&T and China Mobile. And so that was something that uh, my company, Intel, was heavily involved in. And so we have some of those learnings, as well as the future airborne capability environment or FACE, which is part of the open group. Um, and Dennis Stevens was part of that, who's here with us today as well. So this one was the government didn't want to continue to pay to rewrite software as it moved from one platform to the next. And so they wanted to be able to uh, create sort of standards around how that software was utilized and interacted so that they could um, reapply it and reuse it as much as possible uh, to from one platform to the next in order to become more efficient as the, the cost of generating new uh, military platforms was becoming more and more expensive over time. So both of those um, have had very good success in the marketplace, and so we're looking to uh, utilize the learnings from both of those transformations to help us with this one and understand you know, kind of some of the key pitfalls and, and learnings of BKM so that when we do that, we can accelerate this transformation as, as quickly as possible. So um, a little bit on the, the summary of the benefits. So, uh, you know, we talked, you know, these are obviously some very common themes that we've probably mentioned before. Um, but end users, uh, we've talked about supports reuse of the control system application, so that portability of those applications. Uh, increases the value creation, so we want the opportunity for the ecosystem to create additional value, not just um, solving the, the one the end user problem, but also of the the suppliers and the system integrators in the space and the technology providers. Uh, enables continuous innovation, so you have a a common platform. Uh, where you can continually drive forward that pr produces data that you can utilize and, and make your uh, factory run better, more efficiently, higher throughput, and move from today, uh, you know, looking from just how do I make it more efficient to having a manufacturing facility even potentially become a um, strategic business asset for you as you move forward in, in new and innovative ways. Um, solves those integration issues. So one of the things that you know Gene has talked about in his own company is, you know, how do we we have we buy skid tools and how do we make them interoperate? How do we add new features into our control system and allow it to connect in? And we want to be able to have that capability um, is safe and strategically secure. Um, obviously, this is very important for any factory. Uh, it empowers the workforce. So you know, one of the things that we want to be able to do is give the 
the people the tools to be able to do their jobs more effectively, more efficiently uh, in the space. And then ultimately, we believe this can reduce the total cost of ownership. So um, both in the, hopefully in the cap, upfront CapEx as well as operational OpEx as it gets deployed. We have not, you know, we're still working on proving how that might come into play as we sort of understand how, how the transformation might happen. Um, and so that'll be something that we continue to work on. From a supplier standpoint, the goal here is to, that the overall pie grows and the, the top line grows by reaching new markets and customers uh, in areas where maybe there wasn't uh, an opportunity in the past. Data in the IoT space should create uh, new opportunities and new use cases. Uh, remaining relevant to existing customers, obviously you've built, uh, some of the suppliers have built long-term relationships with some of those customers, and so it's important that they have that opportunity to continue. And then creating new goods and services for expanded markets. So as uh, new technologies come out, how do you make sure that you can adopt to those and get to market quickly? And then the idea here is also that you can grow your bottom line through increased margins and reduced cost, uh, eliminating sort of non-differentiated products. So you can uh, utilize products uh, multiple ways so that you know, it doesn't have to be designed the same way multiple times. So uh, you know, obviously, uh, like with most of these kind of things, it, it boils down to better, faster, cheaper. Uh, but you know, obviously, there are, are things that we can try to do here to, to make this uh, continue to move forward. Um, so finally, you know, this is our last slide here today. We'll talk about, you know, we're trying to create an industrial control system with stakeholder companies, um, system integrators, users, hardware and software suppliers, and that ecosystem slide that Gene showed you. And we encourage folks um, that want to know more to, to go to the business guide, talk to Gene or I or any of the other members of the forum that are already here today and tomorrow, uh, and then learn more about it. There's obviously, there's a link here too uh, as well. So I know we've had a lot of interest through the website as we track, you know, folks that are, are reading, you know, pulling up the business guide and stuff. So we're encouraged by that, but uh, looking for more folks to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, we've got uh, quite a few questions coming yes, in for you. You won't be surprised to hear, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> let's see. <laughs> so. Before I get into the into the questions, it's 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 so great to hear you from from our point of view at the Open Group. It's so great to hear you talking about in the still fairly early stages, talking about the importance of certification and conformance, and starting with the business, you know, the, the business needs and the, the the use cases, and that's where it works best. So you know, it's it's completely the right thing to do from uh, from our perspective, and uh, we look forward to working with you on that. So um, a few questions. <clears throat> it sounds as though the potential for efficiencies and savings is huge here. Has anyone put any numbers on this yet? So um, <clears throat> we have, you know, not done that yet. I mean, I think we're looking at it in some individual. Individual companies are probably looking at it, but from a, a total market standpoint, uh, I think that's you know still TBD. You know, yeah. I think right now we're probably there are companies I've seen some reports and uh, publishings that sort of have put some stakes in the ground of goals in the you know how do we cut capex and opex by half or things like that. Right. I mean, uh, right. I know Gene. Yeah, got uh, I'm I'm actually part of another cross industry collaboration, and we're doing. Um, some initial forays into setting up open systems and exchange of, uh, of communication with common data models. And um, as part of that uh, prototype soft simulation, so to speak, um, we're also going to take a look at what engineering hours are saved by, you know, through this use. So okay. it'll help inform what some of those future savings are. Yeah. And I can speak personally as a former like API engineer <laughs> um, that custom interfaces and all the engineering around that huge hours that that come out of the system it's both time and money in terms yeah. of engineering costs yeah you mentioned that as you were you know, talking that the, the efficiency is there uh, next question how is OPC UA similar different or even interesting to the uh, open process automation forum so maybe I'll start with that and I, I'm not <laughs> Um, an expert on OPC UA, uh, I think I read a book about it once, but so that, that's the extent of it. And um, 
Uh, we think that's, that's an important protocol that's been used in, in, in earlier versions, just classic OPC, and now becoming more of an open uh, standard, uh, moving away from some micro Microsoft DCOM components, um, truly becoming an independent um, um, protocol standards, data model. It's, it, it's got uh, many things you can call it, uh, and it's something that this open process automation, the technical working groups are looking at it as one of the protocols potentially as part of the standard of standards. Right. Yeah, and, and obviously as we, we build a control system that utilizes more general purpose types of components, um, time sensitive networking is going to be critical. And so OPCUA is one of those standards that we're investigating to solve that as a problem, right? There are others, uh, but you know that one is is one that's all, of course being discussed. Okay. okay, what's being done to support ontological differences between IIoT devices? There must be vast amounts of time trying to understand what data is and to correlate it to value. You want to take that you one? first. <laughs> yeah. Some, uh, well, I, I, so if I think if I understand the question, so you know, it, it's uh, obviously there's a a lot of data being generated in the industrial IoT sort of transformation that's happening, and so the data model and how you can utilize that data and the speed that it's delivered uh, is very important. So you know, Intel is transforming itself into a data company, so we're very concerned about that as well. Just speaking from my own um, company experience and. You know how that data gets used. I think we're still, you know, as a uh, as a marketplace in general, exploring. We recognize that there's tremendous potential there, and there are pockets of it that um, are taking advantage of it that I've, you know, personally experienced. Uh, but it's still something where we're we're kind of figuring out how that that plays into the marketplace. Yeah, I was just going to add that you know the world of IoT and the data standards are still evolving, emerging. It depends on where in the industry you're coming from. If you're coming from a process control space, you have certain opinions on what needs to, uh, uh, need to be part of the protocol. So uh, again, I'm going to lean on the technical working group to uh, to to look at the the array of standards out there and see what's most appropriate for adoption as part of the Open Process Automation Forum. Right. It's still n a non mature space. Right. I may be wrong, but I, I can probably guess where the where the question came from. We've we've had some uh, some interest in the open group for some time on, on ontologies and and uh, finding ways to. Uh, and we've even got a standard, that, uh, ODEF, which is uh, which is all around uh, making it easier to to find the uh, uh, you know common terminology and and from that's coming in that may be slightly different in one one industry, mm -hmm. but essentially is the same thing, and, and using that. So mm -hmm. I, I imagine uh, somebody's going to speak to you about that if they haven't already. Okay. Um, <laughs> we may be able to help or get in the way. Who knows? And, um, you know, we'll tell you what we know, and we'll make up what we don't, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Uh, you have an impressive collection of industries involved in the forum. Are there any not involved so far that you would like to see uh, join up or get involved, it says? Well, um, you know, I, I know one of the things that we've been pushing for uh, that we think has to make this move forward is uh, our representation of some of the end user manufacturers. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd like to see uh, some increases in uh, as well. And then, you know, it, obviously there's, you know, you'd list out probably numerous companies in various industries, uh, but, you know, we are getting good representation, but, you know, there's always uh, more work to do and, and more engagement. One of the reasons we put the the business guide out was so that people could see that and, and hopefully join us. Yeah, yeah um, and we made a deliberate decision, the business working group, to focus on continuous processing industries, relatively speaking, as opposed to point. discrete parts manufacturing, which often ha already have established standards in their own mm -hmm. um, uh, open, open collaborations. Um, but the idea is we would eventually also either you know partner with them um, adopt some of their standards or work in having their standards conform more to what's being developed out of the open process automation space so continuous industries in particular but with an eye on food and beverage discrete parts manufacturing that uh, in in the future we'd like to see it all under one umbrella okay mm -hmm. Uh, conformance and compliance are very important to pharmaceutical uh, validation process, for example. It, it's embedded into the way the business works. Can you speak to how to convince other industries to work this way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so if you want to work like the pharmaceutical <laughs> division, yes, we're very good at validation, lots of documentation, because ultimately we don't have a right to sell uh, pharmaceutical products. It is a license granted by the government. So we are um, under scrutiny and regulation by the government. And, and to satisfy go government regulators, very strict testing and um, uh, very complete documentation. Um, in some ways, that's, that's why open process automation is such a benefit. Our ability to reuse components, modularity of code, um, porting IP across platforms hinges on documenting the performance of the system and nothing being compromised. And, um, and that's why some of my colleagues are so interested and excited about being part of the forum is that it's well suited in terms of the compliance certification piece towards the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Okay. So that one was uh, mostly for you, Gene. Uh, one that's uh, specifically, <laughs> like specifically for you, Darren. <laughs> oh, um, oh. How is Intel rationalizing the open process automation forum standards work with all the other industry bodies in the same space? Uh, well, that's a good question. So, you know, we, Intel, obviously, we, we play two, wear two hats potentially in this space. We are um, obviously a technology provider, but we're also a, a large manufacturer. So, you know, we're interested in how this goes forward. Uh, we do participate in uh, a lot of different forums uh, and, you know, trying to understand, you know, one of the things that we've been discussing lately is how does the open process automation forum, as well as some of the more sort of generic industrial IoT and fog forums come into play. Right. You know, one thing, um, reason that we're in, engaged here is because it is a very um, specific and targeted path forward for an industry that's looking uh, to make a change. Now, the other ones uh, so far are, you know, dropping in use cases that are across various industries. So this one um, sort of fits into a very specific um, area of the marketplace like you know so like I said you started with on um, the industrial solutions division in IOT mm -hmm. and so this is something that's very interesting to us okay uh, could you elaborate on the challenges with regard to integrated testing and performance of large systems made up of components from multiple vendors yeah I can talk to that and prior to working in the pharmaceutical industry I worked in air, industrial gas, air separation, and energy. And so that uh, power plant example I spoke of earlier was actually you know, one of my previous projects. And the integration systems typically, um, and th this is what was done in the old days, is you would just layer on one overarching control system and then integrate with uh, special drivers or APIs to subsystems. And it was never a clean development of these APIs and drivers. And so um, it part of my own personal unfulfillment of being an integration engineer is part of the motivation of I joined the open process automation forum. I saw the need. I felt the pain um, early on in my career. Um, and so it's very real. Um, and if you look at other industries, if you look at telecom, if you look at face how they have solved the problem through the open published standards. It, it really gives us a path forward to reducing the complexity of the integration. Okay. Uh, when you, you talked about standard of standards and um, not reinventing the wheel but filling gaps, um, uh, when will you begin evaluating existing standards as part of the standard of standards or have you already identified any that will form part of this? This standard. So, I mean, I know in the technical work group, they, they already started looking in those spaces. Right. Um, whether any have been finalized, I'm, I don't, I don't know yet. I think it's still in the evaluation yeah. phase. But, um, you know, the idea is if there's something that exists and is already agreed upon by the industry, there's no reason to try to create something new and in, 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 into that space. I was just going to add, a, a following some of the latest developments of the technical working group, um, they're doing a gap analysis for certain protocols against the requirements and identifying those gaps. So um, the analysis is already going pretty deep yeah. in determining what's, what's most suitable, what protocols will be part of that set of standards satisfying as many requirements as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, where could one find more in-depth information about how the interoperability actually works or its specification? 
guess. You yeah, know, you come join the working group. <laughs> the technical working yeah. group is a great place to yeah. join <laughs> the talk forum with and intelligent be part people. Of it, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> great to hear you guys say that. We need no, more volunteers. I didn't have to. That's technical technical excellent. <laughs> yeah. 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 As with all that, I mean, you. you Talked about workshops, and I know yeah. workshops implies work, and there's work to be work to be done, and uh, and uh, only so many people uh, involved. So, sharing the load is good, isn't it? Yeah, and I, you know we've been at this for you know a little over a year now, and um, I think you know we've made great progress, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Okay, next one. Uh, this philosophy is way overdue. Uh, are the hardware and software suppliers on board, or is there a risk that the titans of industry will adapt to such an architecture, or do new suppliers emerge that are more willing to adopt? Well, I mean, uh, in the forum, we actually have major industrial OEM suppliers engaged. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, Siemens, ABB, mm -hmm. Schneider Electric, and, and others are engaged in the forum. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, if they were not engaged, we'd be a little more concerned in that space. Right. It's, it, we're, we're trying to engage. The forum tries to engage all the players in the ecosystem. Yeah. So, and, and, and th so you have titans, but the smaller players are, are important as well, too. So mm. um, laying out uh, a business case through the um, business model canvas, current state, future mm -hmm. state, is a way to show all players in the ecosystem you know, what, what the future state looks like and you know, get in early so you can learn what this is about and be a player in the future state. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that I'll probably mention as we talk, said in the talk was it's important for us to understand um, how the business model changes for uh, the players in that ecosystem slide that Gene showed so that there is uh, space for innovation and growth. Uh, the idea is that the whole pie grows and everyone course, benefits. Yeah. 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 What, what I love about this forum is the specific engagement on the business side of the piece. How many standards have we seen? You know, a small group of technical experts get together, and it's a perfect technical standard that doesn't solve any business problem, business needs, and kind of lies dormant for, for right. ages. So right. this one has business considerations up front, yeah. driven by business use cases, founder statements, and ultimately translated to the technical requirements. Absolutely. And I, and I think going the extra... Uh, the extra step of the contract guide that you that you referred to when you were talking, Gene. I mean, that actually helps the people who need to use it, or we want to use this standard in procurements or where, wherever they're using it to actually apply it, like like they've done with the uh, the face standard. So. Okay. Um, does the forum envisage a true standard with true portability among solutions, i.e., Profibus or o OPC UA, with enforced conformance? or a standard like IEC 61131, which allows each supplier to develop their own flavor that are close enough. I guess it's hard conformance versus wiggle room. I'm not close enough to, yeah, <laughs> to the technical working yeah, group yeah, to, answer that to, to answer that. I mean, right. I know and that it, the, the interfaces uh, and that inter the idea was that inside of the function, there's a room for innovation and the interfaces would be a fairly hard uh, standard to, to not, not difficult, but uh, uh, strict conformance to. So how that plays out, obviously, we're at a stage where we maybe don't even have the, the right. final answer to that at this point. Uh, Whoever so, asked that question yeah, please should join, join the technical should, working group. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, yeah. OK. So that, that's it for the questions. I, mean, I know I understand you're doing a, a blog on this as well for us at, at the open group. Uh, yeah, I believe it's already been it's all sent already out. Already done. Yeah, Lauren. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, that that's it. Load of questions and uh, great presentation and good luck. You did a lot of work going on this week as well. So uh, good luck with that and um, thank you both. Yeah, thanks, thank you very thanks much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Darren.